Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, and welcome to It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's an Electric Plane, our webinar today on electric aviation. My name is Simbiat Yusuf, Member Relations Manager at Ford. And before I pass it along to our moderator today, um, Anne Ramsey, our Business Development Manager at Ford, we have some announcements. Attendees, we ask that you please submit your questions through the attendee chat. We'll get through your questions during our Q&A portion of the presentation today, as well as we will be sending you the webinar recording and slides shortly after our presentation today as well. And we always like to start with a little bit of introduction about Forth, who we are and what we do as we begin our webinars for any of our new attendees. Forth is a nonprofit trade association and we are working in four main focus areas to advance and advocate for smart transportation. We work in demonstration projects, developing best practices for the industry, um, policy advocacy, consumer engagement, and innovations. And through all these efforts, we are aiming to promote the adoption of clean transportation in an equitable manner. And as well, our Webinars and the work we do can't be done without the support of our members and sponsors. Um, through them, we're able to put on uh, these amazing webinars and promote the work we do. So we want to say thank you to our members and sponsors. And if you have any questions regarding sponsorship opportunity and visibility on our webinars, as well as membership opportunity at Forth, you can reach out to me. My email is on the screen, symbiatwhy at forthmobility.org. And I am able to answer any of those questions for you. More information about Roadmap, our annual conference, Roadmap, the fourth Roadmap conference is going to be virtual in 2021. We will be holding them, for, we will be holding the conference from June 14th through the 16th. Our Mobility for All sponsorship um, scholarship application is still currently open. That will be closing on March 17th. If you haven't attended a Roadmap before, this is a conference you do not want to miss. Um, networking opportunities, great speakers, and a, gr and a great program that we've curated um, with, uh, with our team. If you would like to hear more about the Roadmap Conference, sponsorship inquiries, um, and more about our Mobility for All sponsorship and scholarship, you can reach out or visit our website at roadmapforth.org. Org, or you can reach out to our international marketing manager, Ashley Duplanty. Our email is also provided on the screen, and we will include those information in the webinar recap we send. And with that, I am going to pass it along to our moderator, Ann Ramsey. Thank you, Simbi. My name is Ann Ramsey, and I am a business development manager here at Forth. Um, I work to identify potential sources of funding, including federal grant and foundation opportunities, and also some fee-for-service work. I also help to identify new projects uh, in partnership with our members and also identify new project partners. So I'm particularly excited to talk today about our topic, electric aviation. Um, let's see, and to get us started, we have a little icebreaker here. What is your dream travel ex electric experience, your electric travel experience? And we'll go first to our presenter, Paul uh, Stith with uh, Black and Veach. Paul. Hey, good, good day. Thanks for, uh, for having me to chat about this, one of my favorite topics. Um, so anyone um, out there is uh, maybe familiar with the concept of flight shaming 
And for anybody who's in the decarbonization of transportation business, this is like a frontier that we want to solve. So um, where to go? Well, I, I will admit I have some tickets for um, for traveling uh, in to the uh, French Polynesia in November, and I want to find every way I can to uh, decarbonize that trip. So, Susan, we need to hurry up with that aircraft down there. Um, I'll, I'll just throw that out, the challenge of the day by November. Nice. Okay, so that's a very interesting question uh, regarding traveling or regarding the dream of traveling somewhere uh, in electric airplane. Um, so I am definitely going over to uh, the Scottish uh, Highland and Islands, and I'll be flying, well, not personally, but that will be a te flying testing our airplane over the um, in the islands area. And uh, as well, I have flown the electric airplanes in uh, Norway and in uh, Finland, as well as Australia. And it's, it's uh, just an amazing experience. And especially if you wanna take your dream vacation, flying something that is quiet and that is not polluting the atmosphere, it's just a great, uh, wonderful experience. You won't forget. That's great. Those both sound like Great dream vacations there. Uh, we do have a poll for our audience members here. And uh, our poll is, what industry sector do you represent? Okay. And with that, we will... Um, and our presentation off to Paul here. Paul, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, look very much as I said, looking forward to this, this chat and, and all the chats to come. So I've been with Black and Beach now for coming up uh, really six years right now. Um, and I look after, call it the new markets, things that we are innovating internally and externally with our clients and all of the industry stakeholders. Um, and so if you, you'll, you'll see in some of my slides some of the kinds of projects I've been involved in. Um, and it really hovers around, I can always say hover now in, in aviation, um, things that have uh, higher power and bigger demands on infrastructure. And if you if you take a look at what Black and Beach is up to, and I'll see my slides work here, um, you know across what you know needs to happen in decarbonization, um, we're you know, and, and transportation how these things intersect is huge as far as the opportunity and the challenges. So I think that's something that we're pretty excited to bring. Um, and I'll I'll just dive in if it's right to um, on, on my slides and some of the content. So with that world of you know we need to do these things in um, in parallel i'll say preparing the the energy side the energy supply as well as how that energy is going to be dispensed and uh, the teams that i've been part of in black beach have been working on this really since 2012 uh, and, and scaling up in 2013 building some of the largest networks that actually are, are out and about on the ground so if you um, see what's happening in in transit um, the kinds of things that are happening in medium heavy duty trucks. These are very, very similar um, to the kinds of programs we're gonna need in aviation. And you'll see on, on the map that I've got and some of the things that Susan can present that really you've got um, just this huge opportunity. And, it, and it's very, very distributed as to, in terms of the infrastructure that we're going to see if you think about all where the roads go and if you think about where all the aircraft are today overhead, um, think about you know 10X or more opportunities um, for how that's going to actually play out. Um, because when you open up the, the skies in a decarbonized fashion, in a more cost-effective fashion, um, you know, we'll probably say it a lot in this, but the, the sky's the limit as far as where you want to go. Um, a couple of the programs that, again, are out there that Black Beach has been involved in uh, for Electrify America, uh, for Tesla, over the course of working with them for design engineering, for example, 800 of those supercharger sites. And we participate on the front end as well as on the construction side of that. So what does it really take to design these things, permit them, um, and, and get them actually commissioned and up and running? Um, Electrify America is another great example of that, where we work you know, in parallel in about 20 uh, odd states, 24 states, uh, in, at the same time with hundreds of sites open. Um, 
Now, what folks might not realize, and, and this is again where I, I kind of dive in to the industries in advance, I'm actually about four years into the journey of myself into figuring out about Black and Beach, the work we can do to help the industry in aviation. Um, and in started looking at this, it was on my list when I started and joined six years ago and, and working through it uh, very uh, purposefully to find out what we can decarbonize next. Uh, aviation was on that radar. We delivered a report to NASA uh, in 2018. So timelines, you know, you have to think about it. it's like, and then it was the time before that to actually develop it. What the contents of that report, and of course it's, it's uh, freely available. There are some slides that I can get if anybody is interested um, that back up the, the narrative for it. Really it was like, what should we do to learn about the power industry, the power sector in the United States um, across the different uh, ISOs, uh, across different utility ownerships? And then drill into some of the scenarios of like, well, what would it look like on a 30 story building? What would it look like in a parking garage? What would it look like in, at, at grade? And then what are some electrical best practices for how you might um, bring about that charging, leveraging things that we know today. And, and, and as you move up, we're talking about 600 kilowatt type chargers as sort of a baseline, which is far ahead of what we have today in uh, light duty, 350 kilowatt. And how does that move into medium voltage and so forth? So a lot of educational topics there that we put that out. And then we also summarized that for last year and unfortunately couldn't be the in-person for Portland, um, the uh, electric vehicle symposium. And you can also uh, you know, hit me up for, to, to get a copy of this, the link. And we really summarized the convergence around the uh, uh, what we did for NASA, but looking at regional air, mobility, which Susan certainly will talk about, as well as like, how does that coincide with conventional takeoff and then this electric uh, takeoff vertically um, and, and what is really involved. The key here is, is that there's so many facilities that are actually out there already today. And we need to be thinking about how we address those opportunities to, to build a much larger, more comprehensive fabric of, of transportation. Um, so what I will do is um, talk a little bit more here about that study and then talk about some of the things that have been our recommendations for industry and our, our participation. Here's this, this discussion, which basically is, here's the map, right? Does anybody want to jump on an electric plane on any one of those blue dots? Um, absolutely, a lot of hand raisers very likely, but it can't happen unless we get infrastructure in place in order to make it a reality. And that's both communications as well as what's going to be needed um, uh, for the power infrastructures. So thinking really hard about this, how do you bring those stakeholders together and, and, and make it happen? I've got a couple of cases that we were highlighting. So New York City and, and of course, Uber has done some things with their trials to get you to JFK in just a few minutes instead of potentially hours waiting on a bridge. Um, and what that electrification use case might look like and put it in the context, by the way, of transit. So we've done some of those project pictures. Of course, we're MTA uh, charging it up to 500 kilowatts. Well, that's pretty similar, but you might might, might want to be doing that on the tops of one of these buildings or out in one of the you know public access facilities that are managed along the, on, on the river. So I think that's something interesting that all should be looking at is, is what's the density of this type of an application? And then back to that larger map of like, well, how do we do this in, places like Fresno, California, where they're already flying electric. Um, I took the time to take out of our NASA study some documents here, or more, more uh, a view into, I'll say, of the study. We did look at Long Beach, for example. And, and if anybody's flown in and out of Long Beach, it's just such a cool casual airport uh, compared to maybe the hustle bustle of LAX, but it's really, really convenient. And you could see that the airspace is actually already enabled there. Um, and you are in a position where you could have vertical takeoff landing and as well as conventional takeoff landing. And there's a pretty big difference about those two technologies that I, I know Susan will talk a bit about, um, but energy needs. And of course, like what does a facility look like? Is it, you know, literally take off straight up into the air or, or needs a runway? Um, this project um, kind of really dove into, I mentioned about the cost and infrastructure. We also did some things in terms of siting. What does it look like in order to bring the power to this? And, and that this is that modular architecture that the, uh, the electric uh, engineers of the group will, will love this, as well as the civil side, because you've got to figure out 
how you might do this on a 30 story building or taller. Um, and it's kind of amazing that it turns out we have been putting towers and, and generators and resilience on the tops of large buildings um, for many, many, many years in the telecom industry. Um, so you kind of take a blur or blend of what's needed there and then the hundreds of potential helicopter pads that are out there today. And perhaps like in Portland, our friends here, uh, fourth, just I think just around the corner, um, is you know what would a helicopter pad look like and how do you integrate the things that are needed from a, a signage, from safety, from of course electrical, um, fire uh, prevention, um, what are the you know things that you're going to need to do that are different than conventional aircraft today are successfully using? So it's pretty pretty fun to look at it. And if you've been in um, in the EV side for quite a while, you might have thought about like ADA access. Of course, that's important for disabilities, but it's a new level of security that's needed. It's a new level of concern if you have something that is thousands of pounds that can fly in the air. Um, and, and, you know, maybe not land where it's supposed to. So how do you control that FAA and certifications for, for these vehicles is just um, extremely important for it and how it's happening in Europe and, and Asia and all around the world because these vehicles need to be trusted while they're in the air and they need to have communications available to um, communicate, especially by the way, when they, they do approach and start to work as autonomous. Um, some pretty interesting things that I think we want to all look at as stakeholders together. And I've got kind of my hit list that um, as you start talking about charging infrastructure, some of these things are really important. In particular, I've, I've highlighted here about integration with ground fleets. We've got a lot of interest, a lot of requests about whether it's logistics or whether it's, it's moving people, um, how these new capital expenditures and and budgets that may be preparing for electrification of the sky, how is it that we can actually make that coincide with um, the airspace and, and those investments, be it you know a transit hub, be it a mobility hub for things that need to uh, move faster across the sky, or across a, a region. Um, safety, of course, I've mentioned in the standardization that's going on, you'll see I kind of mentioned that a little bit later about how important it is, is to get it right so that we are not putting stranded assets, but also so that these things can literally plug in when they get there um, and, and have a, a trajectory that's very, very likely, of course, going to be shared. Um, and there'll be some that are more proprietary in nature as far as access, but you've got to, you've got to be thinking about these, these uh, infrastructure investments. Um, with regard to communications, um, it's, it's equally important. You've got to have fuel, but you actually have to be very, very, very uh, studied as to how these vehicles, when there will be a greater volume of them in the air, and there's, they have the potential to be flying at totally different speeds, different trajectories and altitudes in and among the current airspace. So communications among these vehicles, whether it's the radar and whether it's 5G, whether it's uh, sat comms that today are very common, how do those things at different altitudes get integrated? Um, and then when there's massive amounts of new data, how do those things actually look like and be processed effectively, just like the autonomous fleets on the ground? Um, but if you think about it, you're going to have 360 degrees of sensor data, and you're going to have just as much concern as I mentioned earlier, if not more, um, about the, the advent of uh, adverse weather um, or, frankly, you know, anything and all things you can do to make sure that they, they, they don't run into anything uh, uh, or on each other while they're out in the sky. And that could be drones, by the way, that could be delivery parcels. And there's an incredible opportunity to unlock all of those applications for um, medical devices being delivered for people who are, you know, in harm's way, moving out of harm's way. Uh, some pretty, pretty cool things that are out there that I like to make sure it comes across. We're saving time and we're also saving lives with a new application. And we may be benefiting lives, of course, as far as uh, new connectivity. Um, the facilities themselves, to chat a little bit about that. I already mentioned about um, hazmat and security. Think about the new world. In fact, in, in the corona and, and potential pandemic worlds, what else might we need um, to, to travel any of these aircraft that might in fact be safer because you've got less people involved, but you certainly have to secure and, and understand who's 
um, who's boarding these aircraft and then who's certainly controlling them. Um, FBO, fixed base operators, that's something that will become common in lingo in this, and that is really who are the gate operators that might be a little bit um, separate from the regular commercial uh, traffic that already have operations. So if you if you are into an air taxiing into an airport soon, which you might be, um, there's a lot of operators that are the freight, the cargo, and and commercial traffic that are there already that are part of this infrastructure. Um, so be thinking about that. And in many airports, may not yet have that. They could be very rural, and also they might even be on the edge of being put out of quote business because of the use cases, um, and the public are not thrilled about a particular airport. If it were quieter, if it were more accessible and more uh, economic to use, I think that's going to make the facilities be in a really interesting position. Um, can't have this happen without a whole bunch of folks working on that. This is just a little bit of the areas that I interface with. So we participate on Charin. Um, I'm involved with SAE, Euro K, HAMI, um, Vertical Flight. Gamma is a, is a great organization as well that's working on this from the, the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. So lots of folks, lots of uh, work needed to, to make this all um, become a reality. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Susan. Thank you very much for that, Paul. That sounds like a really fascinating study that you guys did with NASA. Um, we're going to turn it over to Susan Ying now uh, with AMP Air. She's the Senior Vice President of Global Partnerships. Susan? All right. I guess it's still cycling. Ah, there it is. Um, thank you, Anne, for the introduction. And uh, just a little bit follow up uh, to the comment I made before regarding the dream vacation. Uh, so I had a dream vacation uh, last year in Australia, like the year before, actually. So flying the um, electric uh, Pipistrol, that's a two-seater electric airplane, that was uh, really quite a treat. But two things there I like to share with everybody. One is that um, the, uh, the airplane, uh, after we flew this wonderful flight. Uh, it was so quiet, so nice. And by the way, it's around Perth. And so the scenery there, you know, with the ocean and um, and the land, it's just uh, gorgeous. And so I asked, you know, uh, what can I do to compensate for the ride? Could I pay them for it? And they said that, um, well, you really don't have to. And then in the end, I insisted. They say, well, how about $3? And I said, what? We have flown for an hour. It was only like three dollars and this is three australian dollars but even then you know it's, it's, it's quite similar to the u.s dollars for the exchange rate so that's just uh, unbelievable because uh, i you know i'm a pilot i used to fly i learned how to fly uh, back in the u.s and um this was even back in the 80s to learn how to fly per hour using a two-seater airplane is at least around a hundred dollars and so now it is going to be three dollars just for the, the fuel the energy alone that's quite a contrast. And uh, not only that, you know, one of the operations, you know, like when we were taxiing and uh, so the tower called us to, uh, you know, hold short uh, and so on. And then when we were holding short, the prop just stopped spinning. So it's a complete silence. And it's like, okay, the tower says, well, are, are you having some issues? Do you want people to go help push you? So uh, it's, it's very different from the uh, typical fossil fuel airplanes. And so with that, I think I'm going to have to, can I move this or I can't move to the next, oh, there, there it is. Okay, so just a little bit of the introduction on uh, Ampere. So recently, you probably have heard in the news that Ampere has been acquired by the Surf Air Mobility, which is a, a mobility company, is not an airline company, is not an airplane company. It's a totally different way of flying for the regional air mobility. And so this new company consists of uh, three parts. So the original Ampere is uh, one of the three uh, parts that's uh, working on the aircraft updates. And then uh, there's the part that's the marketplace facing or customer facing part. So unlike, unlike the uh, typical, for example, airplane company, which will be um, conducting the business as a B2B model, 
while it's here, we're actually a business directly to the end customer. So you could just order a ride on your phone and then go to the air, show up at the airport. There's your ride. Uh, so that's the second part. And then the third part is the air operation. So, for example, the original Surf Air or Mokalele Airlines and so on, that will be part of this uh, air, airplane uh, operations part of the company. So if you think about it, this is a totally vertically integrated company, much like the way how, for example, the United Airlines have started way back uh, in the 1920s. In fact, United Airlines was started by Bill Boeing, who was uh, uh, also the founder of the Boeing company. And, uh, and so United Airlines, and eventually they also acquired the uh, Pratt Whitney company, which is an engine uh, manufacturer, as well as Sikorsky and so on. So that company later on, of, of course, today is no longer around because back in the 30s, uh, they were actually broken up by the U.S. government uh, for the uh, antitrust law and the fact that it's gotten so big that uh, it's not allowing the competition. So um, anyway, for, for us, um, we're not that big yet, obviously. And also, this is a great way to um, getting into the regional air mobility, which is transforming the way how we fly from uh, the way how we operate currently. And uh, let me just jump into uh, this chart. So one thing you heard earlier was uh, the $3 versus $100 per hour of operation in terms of training aircraft. But you could just imagine how that could scale into the uh, overall transportation with the uh, commercial flights. And so this is from last year's World Economic Forum, and I'll emphasize the word economic. So electric airplane is actually one of the top 10 emerging technologies. And how so? Uh, from the uh, electric engine's perspective, uh, so once again, the economics, it has the capability of reducing the cost by 90%. And so that is like one-tenth of the original cost. It's, it's uh, pretty remarkable. And because of the electrical components into the propulsion unit will be a lot more simpler and, that, uh, and also more reliable. So that reduces the maintenance as well as the noise. And if we go to the next chart here. So in the uh, aerospace business and aerospace engineers, we love acronyms, unfortunately. So we have some uh, acronyms, which you have seen in the uh, previous uh, talk by Paul. By Paul. So, uh, so there's actually two different segments or two different uh, markets that we're talking about in terms of the overall advanced air mobility. And one of them is the uh, urban air mobility. And so in which you can see in this graphic that, you know, and Paul just now addressed as well, that you could take off from the rooftops or uh, open uh, areas of the uh, city. And then you can go to the other parts, which even if you go on the ground, it's only like, you know, 10 miles apart. It still requires a, an hour or two just to uh, due to the traffic congestion. So most of the air, airplanes uh, platform on uh, for this segment is called EV tall. That's electric vertical takeoff and landing. And even drones will be uh, part of this uh, urban air mobility. And so they utilize the existing, uh, they could utilize existing operations uh, from the heliports as well as uh, some of the approved uh, new airports, as Paul mentioned. And the uh, the class that we'll be focusing on here, particularly from Ampere, is the regional air mobility. And so the operating uh, platform will be electric uh, short takeoff and landings and conventional takeoff and landings. And um, as we have seen in Paul's charts, we could utilize to more than 10 times of the existing uh, av available airports. And uh, not only that, in the U.S., this uh, could go all the way up to 15,000 different airports, which we are actually paying tax dollars for, for um, maintenance and developing some of these airports. Um, so next chart. So this really introduces a, a, a fundamental shift in the regional operations. So for the customers or for the passengers, instead of having to go from the, this uh, hubs and spokes sort of way of travel, if you want to go from A to B, you got to go to the hubs, nearest hubs, and then to the spokes. Uh, you can go directly from point to point, avoiding all the, uh, the hassles uh, that's at the big uh, hubs of these uh, airlines. And so, of course, un unlocking a lot of the uh, uh, existing uh, uh, airports uh, capabilities that will be leveraging throughout uh, US, Europe, and the, other, the rest of the world. And um, so 
This is just a, a quick introduction in terms of the load factor. The reason why we're traveling in this hubs and spokes model is because we have to load up all these big airplanes so that they will be econo economically uh, feasible. Uh, like during the COVID period, when you have these large airlines with only you know five or 10 passengers or something in the airplane, it just won't make any business case. And so the idea here is the passenger mile per gallon that we're talking about in terms of the economics. And if you look at the large airplanes, such as the 737 going from Seattle to Washington, D.C., you would need to have uh, at least 80 percent low factor or even 100 percent low factor so that you can get something like 100 mile per, per gallon from the passenger's perspective. And then uh, so uh, with an electric airplane, you don't need to load that many people into the airplane to make sense. For example, in 2011, through a NASA uh, technology challenge, Pipistro already proved that with a four-seater model, you can uh, have 400 mile per gallon or equivalent mile per gallon because it doesn't really use any gallon here uh, of efficiency. So that's really very remarkable in terms of this uh, capability of the electric airplanes. However, what that would require is that you're going to need these energy at the um, at the airports. So uh, if we look at some of these big airports, that's already adopting the um, uh, sustainable energy, such as solar or wind. So, for example, in Chattanooga, which is the first U.S. airport that's 100 percent solar. And uh, if you look at this figure, which is published uh, 2.6 megawatt that's uh, available from uh, for the whole year airport from the solar. Well, as, uh, if you look at some of the others, not as high. But if you think about it, for a 19 passenger aircraft, we already need a one megawatt level for one airplane. Now, if you have a fleet of these aircraft coming into the airport and demanding the charge uh, at the time when they're at the hangar or at the uh, uh, gates, this will be a, a really incredible uh, need for the, uh, for the energy right at the uh, airport. So that's, uh, that's something that we really need to work towards. And so for Ampere, we actually have a, um, a project that is uh, working in the UK sponsored by the uh, Innovate UK. Um, by the way, the Innovate UK and um, the Advanced uh, Technology Institute for the UK, uh, they're forming this uh, Fly Zero uh, Challenge that is a uh, Fly Zero, Zero uh, funding and the council that's reporting to uh, Boris Johnson to try to uh, look into, you know, what would enable us uh, to move into the zero carbon uh, uh, flight or aviation, uh, for the aviation uh, industry uh, quicker so that by 2050 it will be uh, totally uh, zero carbon. And so this project looks into that from uh, taking a totally holistic uh, process, holistic eco change approach to, uh, to study this. And so Ampere partnered up with the uh, Rolls-Royce uh, company from UK, as well as the uh, University of Nottingham, and also a power networks uh, company to look into the uh, power distribution and power requirements and storage at the airport, as well as the airport infrastructure folks uh, from Exeter and Cornwall Airport, and also with an operator, the airline uh, operator, Logan Air in this case. And all that uh, uh, supported also by our uh, heart of the Southwest, where there's a huge industry, aerospace industry, a consortium there. So all together in this consortium, we're looking into the electric aviation, particularly from the eco change perspective, perspective, what will be needed to transform this whole thing into uh, the, uh, uh, the next phase. And so this is a one chart that tells all of the story. So from, um, from the top down, uh, the modeling and simulation of this uh, transformation from the hubs and spokes model to the point-to-point -point operational model for the regional uh, aviation utilizing the electric airplanes is modeled by uh, University of uh, Nottingham. And then uh, Ampere and Logan Air uh, work on the operational side. And so in the first phase, we're operating with our uh, electrified hybrid uh, 337 uh, that we call the electric EEL in this uh in uh, in this area in the southwest area and also in this phase we're developing the uh, hybrid electric uh, twin otter which is a 19 passenger aircraft that we're operating uh and we'll be demonstrating in the next phase uh, which is by 2023 24 time frame and the airport partners uh each airport there's uh energy partners there as well for example there's a chv plant right at the exeter airport and a solar park at the cornwall airport and we work with the energy providers there as well. 
Um, so with that, um, we'll just uh, briefly share uh, the Ampere's roadmap to achieving the uh, totally uh, zero carbon electric airplane. Uh, namely, we start with the core, which is the propulsion system. We optimize the core for producing and managing uh, this energy within the airplane such that it could operate with the uh, uh, optimized uh, payload and range for the uh, performance. And then we upgrade these uh, for the existing platform, much like the way how Tesla first started. So we took, uh, for example, the caravan, the uh, twin otter, and perhaps even eventually the sky, uh, sky courier. Uh, for the upgrades, and eventually when the uh, battery uh, performance is improved, we could have the all-new electric airplane operating, and this model is actually a supersonic uh, 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 electric airplane. So with that, I think uh, that's that's the last chart. Uh, I'd like to open for questions. Muted. And I think you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much, Susan, for that presentation. Um, we are going to go now to our question and answer, and we've got a few audience questions here. Okay. The, uh, our first question here, the cost of electricity versus fuel is often mentioned. But what about the cost of battery degradation? And how does the overall total cost of ownership, um, including battery replacement, compare? So, uh, whomever has an answer for that, feel free to jump in here. <laughs> yes, uh, so that's a great question. And that's why I think in terms of uh, the Ampere's model that we actually now have a uh, SAM, which is our parent company, Surface, uh, Surf Air Mobility, uh, we actually would have a very good uh, opportunity to better understand the battery performance. As we all know, in terms of the, um, the state of charge, the uh, the the battery uh, state of health, and, you know, due to the different charging, due to the different cycles, they all have impacts to the battery life as well as, uh, you know, the whole airplane performance. And so through the operational side of, uh, of our understanding, we could improve that. But at the same time, our business model for the battery could be a little different. So while you uh, currently, um, the total ownership of an airplane would definitely include the fuel tank. Right, because you fuel tank, and then you buy the fuel each time. So for us, uh, one of the business models we're exploring is that um, for our customer, which is say the airline, then we could do a, a leasing model of the battery. And so we take on uh, we take on the risk of the battery life and cycle time and so on, as well as uh, the operation that cuts the operational side, uh, so that they're free of that. And at the end, uh, we can share the data to better understand. And perhaps in the next generation of the airplane, then the battery becomes a part of the whole airplane in terms of the overall uh, uh, cost that we're talking. About. Yeah. Uh, Paul, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I think that. You know, I'm I'm pretty bullish on you know battery advances eight percent year over year over year that have just astonished investors and others, um, and and I think that that density thing super plays into aviation, right? So battery durability and density are really the two key things that aviation will need, and I I'm rather confident about that model uh, where where it's going to the technology is going to be there. And I do feel it may be a little bit behind and a little bit ahead, but just in time um, kind of feels what we're experiencing for when aircraft are, are ready for market. And because it's an electron that's being the fuel source, it's just infinitely more portable and, and infinitely more um, interesting what you can do with those batteries, whether they're inside the vehicle or outside the vehicle. Great, thank you. Let's see our uh, next question here. Well, I was, just going, I was just going to add that um, it's actually a, a deeper question than that because in terms of uh, operational side of the battery, 
um, you know, we, we got to charge these batteries and um, it's, it's not going to be in just the next few years, we're going to have the fast charge such that we can support the turnaround time at the gate, for example. And so that's why uh, there's, uh, I know that on the, on the EV side, people have looked at the swappable battery concept, but for the airplanes and, and didn't adopt that, but for the airplanes, that could be a different story. Uh, just because of the requirements of turnaround in terms of operations. But then that's another thing that we need to work together with the airports, because uh, if you want to do that, there has to be a location in the airport. For example, these uh, batteries can be charged overnight, and then during the day you can swap into the airplane and so on. So uh, as I said, that it's a whole eco-chain kind of thing. And so we're trying to understand better what we can do to support the, the overall total cost and also the economic feasibility of the whole supply chain. Great. We've got, we have a ton of questions about batteries coming in here from our audience. So we'll see how many of them that we can get to. Um, our second question we have here though, um, it seems that electric plane technology is developing for smaller sized planes. Um, do you think the battery electric will be able to be adopted for commercial planes like longer trips or will this have to move to like cleaner liquid fuels? So I'll, I'll jump in and Susan, I'm sure you got comments on it. So what the, this audience may not realize is there are already aircraft that are being developed up to 20 seaters, pure electric that can go several hundred miles. Um, if you look at uh, aviation, if you look at what Hart Aero is doing out of Europe, um, they're looking at direct replacement for commuter airlines today. Um, and, and it's, you know, a roadmap that's like five odd years from now. So it's, it's really exciting. The part that Susan mentioned, though, that we have to keep looking at is, is bigger battery means bigger charging infrastructure requirements, more energy. And, and it'll come just like medium heavy duty trucks. It'll, I think it's going to surprise everybody with the, um, you know, what those vehicles can do and then the, the rush to get the infrastructure ready for them. Yeah, so uh, obviously in the industry, we're looking at uh, various ways of uh, uh, doing the sustainable uh, aviation. So it could be with a fuel cell, it could be with uh, batteries. Uh, but then what the, our strategy is to look in the meantime, looking at the hybrids, because with a hybrid, uh, we're already able, for example, for 20 seats, we could go up to 500 nautical miles uh, without any issues. And uh, as far as going further, um, uh, I'm sure the uh, the development of the battery is going to, you know, that that's in parallel to the 8% per year, you know, maybe it'll be a different chemistry uh, model or whatever. So that's very hard to say, uh, but I think in the meantime, hybrid will be a, a good solution for that. And, and I will put in that there are several airframe, um, you know, uh, collaborations around using hydrogen as well, um, and that that I think are going to have their place in the market. There's, you know, a lot there though to figure out. Um, and back to the same thing with the with transit medium heavy duty trucking, how do you get that volume? How do you get the ecosystem for hydrogen to, to make all of that work out? I, I do think there's a, um, there's a future to it. We just got to get all the pieces together and, and then the race is all Yeah, and I think the whole key, the key word here is the ecosystem. Uh, because if you look back in terms of uh, the plant-based oil or, or you know, uh, SAF, uh, synthetic uh, aviation fuel or whatever. So the plant-based oil, uh, I think uh, uh, Boeing, for example, has demonstrated this uh, together with NASA uh, more than a decade ago that, you know, you could put that into an existing jet and, and fly around. And even today, uh, I think United Airlines flying out of LAX uh, uses uh, the SAF for, for fueling. However, uh, why is that nobody else is using that? Well, because in order to do this, the eco chain would require the um, definitely the, the farmers that plant these uh, plants, uh, the algae or whatever you have. And then you also need the producer for uh, making this fuel from the, the plants. And so this whole system has to exist and then it has to make business case for this whole system. So, for example, the producer of some of these, they well, they went bankrupt. Because nowadays, there's uh, today, there's probably less than a handful of these producers because they rather make cosmetics than making the, the fuel. 
because they don't make the profit in doing that. So if it doesn't make a business case, this ecosystem will not uh, be successful. And similarly with hydrogen, um, that's why it's so critical. For example, if in the process of trying to generate the hydrogen, you're actually generating more carbon, then that would not make sense, uh, you know, in terms of business, in terms of environment. So uh, a lot of things have to be considered here. Yeah, Susan, I'm not sure if you mentioned this in your presentation, but we've got a question here. Um, what will the range of the aircraft being trialed in the UK be? The range in, uh, oh, that's a very good question. So range in the UK, we're trying um, is actually around 50 to 60 nautical miles, but it's across the water. So it's uh, among the islands. But one of the things that we're actually still considering uh, uh, just considering maybe that we could do it. There's a hop from uh, Somburg, which is part of the Orkney Island up there, uh, north of uh, the north part of the UK, across to Bergen, which is uh, in uh, Norway. So uh, as we all know that Norway is one of the uh, four, four front runners in terms of uh, electric aviation. And so they op they're open arms in terms of, you know, welcoming us to, to uh, have a trial hopping across that, and that is 250 nautical miles. And so far, we have demonstrated um, that we could fly for 340, uh, 342 miles. That is from uh, LA to San Francisco, basically. And so it's doable, especially when it's not very windy up there, but it's, it's a lot of risk. And um, so, so that's the overall range of story. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, let's see, our next question here. Um, what materials are needed for these fleets and is embodied energy carbon a concern during the transition? So, uh, so uh, materials, so um, given the fact that, um, for example, on Ampere's roadmap you have seen, currently we are, are looking at uh, more of the conventional materials. Uh, because it's uh, just an upgrade to the existing airplane. Um, so uh, it's not going to be that much of an impact. But certainly in uh, in our consideration for brand new airplanes, we could consider the very sustainable, uh, you know, process for, you know, using the material that is uh, sustainable and also lightweight because everything in the aerospace has to be lightweight, and especially when you put such a, a battery in there. Uh, so that's, that's all I can say for right now. Okay, great. Um, and our next question here, I know this is something that um, we frequently discuss in the electric car world. Um, our One of our audience members says, following up on the actual cost of batteries, what about the social cost of batteries? Uh, most of the rare earth materials for hybrids and electric vehicles are mined um, in Africa by near slave labor. So I don't know um, if you guys, consider that for your electric airplane batteries? So I'll, I'll take a shot at that. So all of the renewable, many of the green renewable energy and progress in transportation are reliant on materials such as copper, such as lithium um, and cobalt. And, and finding ways to reduce the use of those is certainly top of mind and a lot of push and pressure towards that. Um, but I think you might take a look if you haven't at what the mining industry is trying to do on a global basis to actually net out their carbon um, and, and find ways to you know, increase their social stewardship, I'm going to say. But if, you, if you're looking at solar panels, if you're looking at motors, if you're looking at batteries, um, they do use these materials. And I think that we need to do everything we can to, to make that scenario better. And then if you look at like redwood materials and others to, to recycle them, to put them into use the second life, for example, and that's a very difficult use case, or take them back to their materials. I think that that's, that's the responsibility of everyone here in the audience to, to hold it to that level of accountability and also figure it out because putting out challenges are, are something that's, you know, one way, the other way is to turn it on its head and, and figure out a solutions for it. Susan, did you want to add anything or just 
And no, I totally uh, agree with that um, because this whole thing about uh, just on the battery alone in terms of the, the whole cycle life, uh, especially, you know, for example, for the airplane side, you know, the, the whole safety issue is that, you know, we want to make sure uh, during its uh, first part of the cycle life, we use it on, you know, on the airplane for the safety, reliability and maintainability. But then as it gets to towards the end, you know, some of that batteries could be used for other purpose, uh, for example, for the energy storage on, on the airport and for other uh, type of uh, less safety critical uh, type of applications. And of course, the, the materials themselves can also be uh, taken for other type of recycled usage. But a lot of that is going to depend on the development of the battery technology and also the chemistries going forward. And it's very hard to read that crystal ball right now. All right, sure. Okay, I think we're going to go to our last question now. Um, Susan, I know that you yourself are a pilot. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about the implications of new pilots learning to fly on an electric airplane versus combustible engine airplane and, and how electric aviation could break down um, the economic barriers to licensing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's really a, a great, great question because... Uh, you know, unfortunately, I already got my license. I couldn't go back and relearn it using electric airplanes. It's um, much more enjoyable because, uh, you know, when you fly in those fossil fuel airplanes, I mean, uh, I still wear my headset for the electric airplane, but uh, the noise is sometimes is really unbearable and you have to wear these headsets uh, for the noise. But then um, at the same time, the fossil fuel just costs so much like, you know, when I was a student learning how to fly, I actually worked out a deal with a flying school such that I could, you know, work for, this is Amelia Reed uh, in San Jose. So I actually worked out a deal such that I worked for her part-time watching the airplanes and doing office work and so that I can exchange for the flying lessons. Yeah. Well, as um, all the new students, just imagine, instead of paying $100 an hour, now you're paying, you know, like $10 an hour. For, uh, for learning how to fly. And of course you have to add on to the uh, CFI, Certified Flight Instructors now too. But that is still nothing comparing to the fossil fuel uh, requirement. And so you're gonna have a lot of people who's passionate uh, to fly, but don't have a big pocket you know, to support that. So I think this will really break down the barrier in terms of uh, you know, getting the new pilots. And we do need the new pilots because I think I read somewhere that in you know the way how the aviation is uh, increasing, uh, they a lot of the pilots are retiring and so on for these transport commercial transport airplanes, and so that training will come in just in time, and I think it's very very exciting. Um, and not only that, we're also responsible for the uh, uh, climate, for the atmosphere as well, right? Because uh, typically these uh, fossil fuel planes, you know, we're actually polluting the atmosphere by this is pre-COVID at least 900 million tons of carbon dioxide per year, 900 million tons. And that's why I think earlier on, Paul or somebody was mentioning that, you know, aviation by 2050 might become one of the highest, you know, polluters among all the industry sectors. Wow, great. Yeah. All right, we do have time for one more last question here. Um, and in planning for an electric aviation future, what should we be doing now um, to have a successful transition over to that? Paul, do you uh, want to take that one? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, and I think all we need to do is, is look to what's going on in the ground world and then um, multiply it by some factor of four to five to 10 you know, of the level of effort, right? Um, and I and I say that because you can't really charge these airplanes in your garage, okay? Multi-families are not gonna necessarily have an EV tall port on their roof. Um, so so some of the solutions that work on the ground and, and transit facilities, of course, there's a, a pretty combined mission of that fleet to do what it needs to do. In aviation, we've got a real mixed um, set of stakeholders. We've got municipal airports, we have commercial airports, we have operators, we have the FBOs, and then we have all of the different business models that are going to start to come together. So we need to do the same things as ground, but I think we've got to get a bigger lasso around 
all of the ways that these things are funded. And you also have to think about it that they're going to fly from one jurisdiction to another. Immediately, they're going to go to cities. So you need to have a network and you're going to go across state lines and you're going to go across utilities very quickly because that's one of the points you can move quickly in the, in the air. So how do you build that collaboration to the nth degree similar to what needed to happen on the ground, which is still happening today? So I think that the, the, you cannot you know, emphasize enough about planning collaboration and then fully appreciating what these vehicles can do and what the infrastructure will cost and who's going to pay for it in order for them to be successful. So today is really getting the sleeves rolled up and figuring those those questions out, which is pretty much the theme of you know what we've been saying in, in the ground fleets. And, and it's come pretty well true. So we, we, uh, we think we know a thing or two about what's going to be needed in the air. And well said, Paul. And in fact, I totally agree with what Paul is saying. But then uh, one, there's just one thing I'd like to add, and that is the United States has been behind. And uh, if you look around the world, uh, many countries have their policies set such that by 2050, for example, you know, like in Norway, 2050, they have said that everything has got to be, you know, sustainable, electrified or whatever in the transportation sector. That's ground, marine, as well as air. And similarly, in the UK, they also have uh, similar policies and they put the money where their mouth is, right? So Boris Johnson has this uh, uh, Jet Flight Zero Council. And so they gather all the uh, the council members and they put the fundings, you know, 300 million and another 300 million to pounds to develop uh, all these collaboration projects. And that's that's why we were in that collaboration project. And so I think the, uh, the support from the policy side is very important in driving from a top down uh, uh, perspective to the collaboration and to enable this whole ecosystem and the stakeholders to work together. And there is a federal bill in the Senate um, and House uh, matching right now to establish that framework for the United States. So um, get, get in touch with Washington on that, that topic for sure. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us. We have one final poll question for you all um, before we get going uh, today. Um, I want to say thank you so much to, for all of you for joining us today. I want to say thank you to our moderator and fantastic job. And a big appreciation to our speakers today, Paul and Susan. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your wealth of knowledge with us um, today. So so truly, truly appreciate that. Um, as you know, we had a lot of questions coming in and we could not get through all of them. We will be sharing a recap email with you all and we hope the conversation continues that way. Um, also, you can see on this screen, we have our speakers and panelists emails and contact information. Um, we will also be including that in the recap email as well. Um, feel free to send any questions to myself. Um, my email is symbiatey at fourthmobility.org, and I'll pass it along as well, um, which can all be done through the recap email. And next, uh, in two weeks, um, we hope you can join us on Tuesday, March 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific time for Plug In and Set Sail, The Rise of Electric Boats, our um, Senior Manager of Strategic Communications and Partnership, Kelly Stevens, will be joined by Kevin Bartoy of the Washington State Ferries and Alexander Oki from Pure Watercrafts to discuss moving goods and people through an electrified waterway. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We truly appreciate you taking the time today. You could be anywhere today, but you chose to be with us. <laughs> um, so. Um, Thank you again, and we hope to see you in two short weeks uh, for electrified waterways. Thank you. Thank you.